So unfortunately, I think one of the problems with medical training is they're not actually training doctors to be critical thinkers, but to, to sort of uh, accept whatever is the wisdom of the day. So then you want to look at where does the wisdom of the day come from. And you think, oh, the doctors are probably reading medical journals and looking at the methodology section and the data. That doesn't happen. They're lucky if they glance at the abstracts. And so often the abstracts are spun. They're not actually consistent with what's in the data. But then really, you know, for, especially for a long time, is you'd have these free dinners, continuing medical education dinners. They'd go out to a nice restaurant, the doctors, say psychiatrists. And there you'd have a famous person or a fairly famous person giving a talk about the wonders of the latest drug. So one thing is is freebies, basically, free dinners, and, uh, et cetera. That was really big in the 90s and the first parts of the 2000s. And then next you have <coughs> drug reps. They come around and they come to doctor's offices, and at least for the longest period of time, what they did is they would give, um, oh, they'd bring in breakfasts, they'd bring in lunches, they'd bring in, you know, some sort of food to eat in the afternoon. And what would happen is you'd, 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 you'd bring this food in, Okay, by the drug rep, and the drug reps often are sort of, uh, you know, the only way to put it is pretty young women. Um, and then they might bring in a speaker to give the talk, a doctor to, to give the talk. But what you have, therefore, is uh, a, a method of disseminating information to prescribing doctors that involves, um, that's where they're getting their information from. It's from pharmaceutical companies basically, um, you know, pitching their product. And often they'll live, leave free samples, that sort of thing. And then high at least for a long period of time, high prescribing doctors would be invited to, um, uh, you know, trips or sort of annual conferences, that sort of thing. So you see money sort of really governing medical education, continuing medical education, what doctors learn at their offices, what young residents learn. So money is greasing the storytelling at every step of the way. And, and it goes all the way from money greasing what the academic psychiatrists say to what the ordinary doctor in his office learns about. So everywhere what you're seeing is a commercialized a sort of presentation of supposed scientific information. And then, you know, the other problem you, you do see, of course, is, well, you think the medical journals. Well, the, the former editors of the medical journals like JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine and British, uh, uh, BMJ, British Medical Journal, they've all said that like, basically we became vehicles for, for uh, sort of story laundering. In other words, they began where they couldn't even trust what was being published in their own journals because of this corrupt process. And then you also have the problem that uh, advertisements are going to the medical journals. That's what they rely on for, to you know, um, fund their operations. So if, if we deconstruct this storytelling process in our society, this information that gets out to the public, to prescribing doctors, what you really see at every step of the way from the beginning of the generation of the evidence space is a story of commerce, a story of creating a story and then disseminating that story that will support a, a market, support a product. And that's what you see at every step of the way. Now, supposedly, it's getting cleaned up some uh, because it got so out of hand in, the, you know, by 2008, 2009. Um, but I don't really know how much it's getting cleaned up. That's sort of still we need to see. What we do know is from mid-1980s to 2010, uh, roughly, in psychiatry, it was the wild, wild west with uh, money greasing this storytelling process from A to Z.